Hey everybody, it's Rick with Let's Level Up again, and uh, today I wanted to talk about um, a game that is a, a spin-off to The Resistance. I say spin-off. Um, it is The Resistance Avalon. Um, this is The Resistance, as we all know and love, but with a few new interesting mechanics, and it's all based in the old Camelot era with Arthur and Mordred uh, battling uh, for England, basically. Um, this is a very fun game. It has all of the elements of the Resistance, so if you like the Resistance, I strongly recommend you check this out. It's around the same price tag. You get it at Cool Stuff Inc. Uh, for under 15 bucks. Um, I think Amazon has it for 15 straight up. Um, your local game store probably has this as well. If not, they have the Resistance. If you hadn't checked this out yet, we're going to go through and show you how to play this game in this video and show you some of the new mechanics that are unique to Avalon versus the Resistance. Hope you enjoy it, thank you, and let's game. The Resistance Avalon is a standalone game, but it's still the Resistance. At its core, it's still gonna be the exact same thing. It does introduce a few different mechanics, which we'll get to later in this video. But first, let's figure out how to play the resistance. It breaks down very simply. There are going to be some members on the table who are resistance, which are designated by the blue backgrounds, and some member who are going to be spies, which are designated by the red backgrounds, um, or the red symbol versus the blue symbol. Um, now, the, the resistance in this game are, are referred to as loyal servants of Arthur, whereas the spies are going to be called minions of Mordred. So if you look here, um, this is the tableau. Uh, you will pick the tableau depending on the number of players that you have playing. Uh, again, this game plays five to ten players, and there'll be a number of players here in the, in the bottom right-hand corner of the tableau. Uh, these are double-sided, so just flip it over if it's not the correct. So for, for instance, this game is for seven players, um, whereas the other side is for eight. It'll also tell you the number of minions of Mordred that are going to be present. Um, so what you need to do is take five cards in this, in this example and three minions of Mordred and you will take this deck and give them a good shuffle. Uh, this is known as your roll card. Uh, this will basically tell you if you're going to be a member of the resistance or a member of the spies. Um, so after you give this a good shuffle, I generally just fan it out and go to each player to have them pull their card wherever they want. Um, you, can, you can deal them, you can do whatever you want. Uh, there are uh, two rules which I've stated in my other videos already. Um, rule number one is you can never show somebody this card unless you're using a plot card that says they can see it. Um, but for the base game, you will never show anybody this card. You can't prove by showing this that you are in fact a member of the resistance or you are in fact a spy. That's one. Uh, the second rule, which we'll get into a little bit deeper whenever we talk about actually going on the quest, um, has to deal with the resistance members who are part of the quest can only ever vote success on that quest. And we'll get in it again, we'll get into that a little bit later. So let's talk about the tableau a little bit more. Um, the main part of the tableau is to keep track of scoring. It also lets you know the number of people who you have to nominate on the team in order to go on the missions. So for instance, quest one requires three individuals to go on the team. Uh, quest two requires four, quest three requires four, quest five requires, uh, sorry, quest four requires five, and quest five requires five. Now there is an instance where anytime you're playing with number of seven, uh, players seven or higher, uh, quest 4 requires two failures in order for it to be failed. The rest of these quests just require one failure. And again, we'll talk about that here in a second. There's also the vote tracking, which is designated by this token here. Um, whoever is going to be the leader, uh, designated by this crown token, will nominate a team to go on each of these missions. Well, the leader doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean if you're nominated you're going to be going on the missions. Everybody's going to have a, two of these tokens of the, with the sandbag on it. One is going to have a white pebble for accepting, and the other is going to have a black pebble for rejecting. 
everybody at the table, including the mission leader, will vote to see if that team is approved or not. So when you have your vote, you lay your card down face down, and then everybody will simultaneously reveal um, after a count of three or however your team decides you want to do it. Uh, in this case, rejects always win on ties. So in order for the team to be accepted, you have to have the majority vote. Um, now, if the spies ever at any point during one single quest, meaning on quest one, two, or three, ever get five failures, and this goes off the track, spies immediately win the entire game. So if they're able to cause enough confusion to get the team from assembling five times in a row on a specific quest, game over. So, when you have dealt these cards, these roll cards, you know your roll, there's one thing you have to do before you can actually start playing the game. Uh, so let's say I'm a loyal servant of uh, Arthur. The player to my, uh, to my right is going to be a minion of Mordred. So I'm going to look at my card, he'll look at his card, and then we're going to do something that my, my table, my, my, my uh, playing group, likes to call the spy prayer. And this is essentially, uh, it goes as follows, and this is normal resistance now. Um, everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. And somebody from the table will actually be saying this out loud. Uh, you can nominate whoever's going to be the first team leader or whoever's the most experienced player can do this. Um, so essentially, they'll say, all players, close your eyes and look at the ground. Now, spies or minions of Mordred, open your eyes and acknowledge one another. Now, all players, close your eyes and look at the ground. Now all players open your eyes. So this gives the chance for the spies to know who one another is. Now, as a resistance player, the only thing that I know 100% is that I am in fact a member of the resistance. So the spies have a little bit of the upper hand. Spies know who one another are. He, the, this, For instance, this spy would know that my player on my left and the player who is uh, facing the camera right now are also spies and the other members are resistance. Um, so, with that knowledge, the spies will try to deceive their way onto the team in order to sacrifice the missions. Again, we're playing a total of five different quests, or missions as I've been calling them, and it's really the first person to three. So sometimes you may get a sweep, and you may only play three quests. That's very possible. Uh, sometimes you'll go down to the fifth, and I think the majority of the time you'll end up going down to the fifth quest. This token here will designate, and you'll put it on the sub-circle underneath the larger quest circle to let everybody know what quest you're on on the tableau. So after you've designated your roles, uh, it's time to pick a team leader. So someone will get this team icon here, and then depending on whatever quest you're going on, that team leader is going to nominate via handing out these shield tokens, um, members of the team. So let's say he nominates himself, the player to his right, and then the player to his left as well. This is where the team voting comes in. After all of the tokens have been handled from, uh, sorry, after all of the uh, tokens have been handed out, everyone is going to then vote on that team. And that brings us back to our approve and reject pebbles. So everybody will cast a vote in secret, and then after a three count or after a certain number of time, everyone will reveal their vote. Again, in order for the team to be accepted, the majority uh, has to be approved. Ties go to reject, and of course, the majority of reject means the, the team is not. Anytime the team does not assemble, you take your vote track token, you slide it down one, and the uh, quest leader passes to the next player. Now, even after the team is assembled and the mission goes, regardless of its success, this is still going to pass to the next player. So this token was going to pass around the table as each turn goes by, or as each failed uh, team goes by. It's important to hand out these tokens. We get lazy sometimes and we don't hand them out, uh, but we, always, we, we have to ask the question, wait, who's on the team? Quite a bit. And sometimes we're doing it to see who's paying attention, sometimes we're doing it to see if maybe we can get some information out of anybody or somebody. Uh, this game is one of those games that anything you do uh, your body language, the way you vote, what happens when you're actually on the mission is telling. This is a game about reading your opponents. It's not about these tokens or this tableau. 
It's about knowing who you're playing with and having the ability to either build faith in yourself or deceive your friends in order for you to get on these quests and fail it. This is a game where anyone can play and I have never had somebody play this game who didn't absolutely love it. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when you're actually on the team. So let's say in my previous example, these three players have the shield tokens and the team is actually accepted for quest one. Now this player here is a spy, let's say this player here is resistance and I'm resistance as well, or as I should be saying, a loyal member of Arthur, a loyal servant of Arthur. Everybody's going to be given two cards, a fail card and a success card. These are going to be dealt to everybody or handed out, and then every player will then take a look at those cards and secretly cast their vote. Remember, back to rule number two. If a member of resistance is on the team, they can only ever vote success. And now, also remember this is always secret. So regardless of whether I actually threw success, if this spy over here can convince the players that I'm the one who failed the mission, well, it's going to be really hard for me to try to backpedal my way out of that and, again, build faith in myself. Um, so that these two cards are given, you'll take your success card. I've generally been handing it to the, whoever is the team leader. Um, at the time, he's going to be the one that's going to get the votes, and then whoever said the team leader is right will get the slough, or the left, or maybe across the table. But somebody else needs to get the slough off card, or basically the card that is not the vote, just to avoid any confusion. So again, I'm resistance, I can only vote success. My the other player is resistance, they can only vote success. So we'll hand his slough card over here. Again, these are, these are all hidden, so nobody knows the results yet. Um, now, the spy, on the other hand, over here, has the ability to either cast success or failure. Now, on games that are, I believe, six or lower, uh, I believe Quest 1 is only ever two people, so it's a little bit hard for you to be on that first team and fail it and be able to successfully do it. But again, you're only playing to three. So if the, five, the spies can successfully fail three missions in a row, they're off to uh, they're going to win the game. If they fail that first mission, they're off to a really strong start. Um, so the spy has the opportunity to either vote success or vote fail. So in this case, I'll say that the spy is going to vote fail. They'll cast their vote. They'll hand their slough off to the other player. Both of these new little decks here are going to be shuffled really well um, by whoever's holding them. It's important to shuffle the slough off deck as well, um, just so that there's nobody counting the cards and figuring out who did what and knows the reverse order of whatever happened. Um, now, I generally like to build a lot of uh, anticipation up for this, so I will cast the votes one at a time. So I will say, okay, vote one is a success, vote two is a fail, and vote three is a success. That lets everybody know, including the players that were on the mission, that somebody on that team was not loyal to Arthur, or was not a member of the Resistance, basically. Any time there is a fail on the mission, the entire mission is a wash. Uh, so the spies will win that round. Now, if all three of these were successes, regardless of whether there's a spy on the team or not, the Resistance would have won that round. But in this example, spies are going to take the first round one to nothing. Then you take these cards, you mix them back in with the slough, and you're ready to start the next turn. So this token is going to hand over to the next player. They will nominate a team of four people, and you'll go on until there is a clear victor. Now, let's talk about what makes Avalon unique. Um, first and foremost, there are a whole series of expansion cards that you can add to Avalon that introduce other characters that are either loyal to Mordred, um, or loyal to Arthur. Now each of these add a very interesting kind of complex element to the game um, that we'll get into a bit later. Um, so let's talk about just the base. There are two things in this game that make it stand out from the normal resistance off the bat. And this is the base of Avalon now. One of the members of the resistance is going to be Merlin. Now what's interesting about Merlin is Merlin is going to know the identity of the spies. So this is going to be changed up in what I call the spy prayer. The spy prayer for the resistance goes like this. Everybody put your hands in the center of the, uh, of the table. 
Everybody close your eyes and look at the ground. Spies, look up and acknowledge one another. Spies, close your eyes and look at the ground. Spies, open your thumb and give a thumbs up. Now Merlin, open your eyes and see the spies. Merlin, close your eyes. Spies, put your thumb down, put your fist back to normal. Now everybody close your eyes and begin to play. Um, so this little variant here means that Merlin is going to have an edge. The resistance should have an edge going into these games. However, one of the spies, oh, where'd that card go? One of the spies is going to be an assassin. And the assassin's job is if somehow the resistance win, and they get three missions before the, before the spies get three, the, the spies, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the assassin has a chance to steal victory from the resistance. If the, if the assassin can pinpoint who at the table is Merlin, he can assassinate them before victory, thus wiping the whole game and uh, uh, essentially making all of the resistance win spies, and spies would win at that point. So it's possible for the spies to get blanked all three, all three of the first rounds, yet still somehow win. So the assassin is going to be randomly one of the spies. Merlin will be randomly one of the members of the resistance. That's the differences when it comes to the game. That's what makes Avalon different from the resistance. Now, the core mechanics of the game are the exact same thing. You're still doing the same thing. It's a still amount of bluffing. It's, it's the, sorry, the same amount of bluffing, the same amount of deceit, the same amount of what makes the resistance so good. It's only adding a couple new elements. Now, it's possible for you to play Avalon without ever buying Avalon. If you have a copy of the Resistance, it's very easy to say, this card's Merlin, this card's the Assassin, and then let's play. Uh, subsequently, I could take these cards out of the game and play normal Resistance with Avalon set. Um, I've bought both. I think that uh, you know Don Eskridge has really got uh, Don Eskridge has got a great game in Avalon, and I really try to support indie board and cards. So I would definitely recommend you buy this game if you like it. Try out the normal resistance, or maybe swap that and vice versa. Okay, so let's look at some of the other things that make Avalon unique. First and foremost is going to be the Lady of the Lake token. Now this can be added to the game without adding any sort of other rules to the game, such as uh, that come in this stack over here. Uh, the Lady of the Lake goes to whoever the leader is on the right, and the Lady of the Lake has the ability to have somebody assign a roll card to them and uh, essentially know where their loyalties lie. Now this is actually going to get passed around as the game uh, goes forth. I haven't actually played with this variant in place. It seems like it could act actually add a couple interesting elements to the game. Okay, so some of the next thing is going to be Percival. Now Percival's added to the game, and Percival's ability is he's going to be on the side of good, and he is going to know who Merlin is at the first of the game. Okay, the next character that can be added to the game is Mordred. Now, Mordred is unique because Mordred does not reveal himself to Merlin at the start of the game. So Merlin will, be, uh, will not know that Mordred is a deed in the sight of evil. Now, Morgana's special ability, again for the sight of evil, is the fact that she is a faux Merlin. So when Percival opens his eyes to see Merlin, he, she, uh, he will see both in, uh, Merlin and Morgana, making it a little, a little more difficult for the side of good. And finally, the last character is Oberon. Oberon is, uh, is a unique character because Oberon does not reveal himself to the other players that are playing on the side of evil or on uh, the minions of Mordred, rather. This allows uh, for a little bit more... Uh, bluffing a little bit more deceit and it makes things a little bit harder for the spies or for the side of evil I think in order for them to win because they don't know that they can trust them. 
Um, I can also see that playing to my advantage. If I were Oberon, I'd be able to do that, convince the spies that I am in fact resistance, and also uh, convince the resistance that I'm part of them, and then on the last mission, come in and fail it. So that's it. That's how you play the resistance, and that's how you play Avalon. Again, the game itself at its core is flawless. Uh, it plays 5 to 10 players. It's extremely cheap, and I think anybody who plays this game is going to absolutely love it. And I think you will as well. Uh, definitely check this out, and if you have any questions, drop us a line on Twitter, at Let's Level Up. You can leave a comment below this video. If you like what you saw, please subscribe, please like, uh, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, any social media that there is that are out there, and at least the big three. Um, that would really help us out a whole lot. Whoop. And I'm just going to jumble all these up and give them a toss uh, because we're done. So thank you so much and game on.